The role of the solo cornet is really the lead voice of the brass section. We have our, there's a concert master in a band. We have a principal clarinet who sort of functions as the leader of the woodwinds and the principal cornet, solo cornetist, functions as the lead voice in the brass section. So essentially that's my role. A cornet is similar to a trumpet, but it's slightly different in design. A trumpet is cylindrical throughout the piping and it flares at the bell. A cornet is conical in design versus cylindrical, and it gets gradually larger and larger as it goes through the instrument. It gives it a little more mellow sound. It blends better with the woodwinds. Playing a solo in front of the band is one of the most satisfying and terrifying at the same time experiences. Um, it's stressful, but it's always incredibly satisfying when it's all said and done. In the whole suite, my favorite solo is in the second movement. It's something I'll warm up on some days just because it's, it's the kind of tune that'll get in your head and you'll just be humming it all day long. It's very beautiful. For me, getting warmed up is just a matter of getting a little bit of flexibility in my lips. Um, so the things I'll do right off the bat are sort of start in the middle register of the horn and maybe do some slurs or some, just to get some vibration happening in the instrument. And I'll often start in that middle register and sort of stay there for a few minutes and then go down to the lower register of the instrument and then sort of work my way up. So it's, I don't do a long warm up where it takes me half an hour. It takes me usually about two minutes to get where I'm feeling, where I can start my daily routine then, which is very different than a warm up. Maybe some people think of them in the same way, but for me, they're different things. Warming up is just getting where I can produce sound from my instrument. Now my routine would be the next thing I would talk about. Um, is there's certain building blocks that you want to work on, sound, articulation, flexibility, agility on the horn. Um, so each day after I get a little bit warmed up, I'll do some articulation studies usually. I'm just looking for a nice pop on the note where it's responding quickly and has a, a little bit of life to it. Improving my high register, one of the big things that I do, and I'm not exactly sure why it works. I've talked to other teachers and professionals about it, and they all kind of agree that the better my low register is, the easier my high register is. And I think it's something about the, just the ease of how I'm getting up into the upper register. So each day I do touch the low register a good bit before I start getting up high. And I'll even work on into the pedal register, which is below the actual instrument. It's not the prettiest sound, but it is something that's helpful for me. Again, not the prettiest sound I would never do in a performance. But when I have those notes vibrating and being able to kind of force the sound down there, when I go up in the high register, it, it feels good and easy. And I'm sort of trying to keep that same airflow that I was using in the low and just apply it to the high I'm not really changing too much. I'm not pushing or tightening up. That's one thing I think most young players struggle with, and I did for years, and I do still from time to time, is tension in the body. And as much as you can be at ease doing what you're doing, even though it's not easy, and it's the, the natural thing is to, when you're going high and you get nervous, is to tighten up everything, and, but it just sort of closes everything down, so it makes it harder to actually achieve what you're going for. So as much as you can stay kind of loose and down, I think about having my shoulders relaxed and my body sort of settled. I'm maybe doing my best through all those registers to kind of have it be the same. So that's something I've found has been very helpful for me is just 
keeping the low even with the high, and it makes the high seem a little less daunting when it's, if you're thinking low while you're playing high. One of the things I found working with students is a lot of them, even in collegiate settings at good schools, have an underdeveloped sound. They, they can play difficult concertos and excerpts and things, and that's all well and good, but it doesn't sound good. So you're hitting all the right notes, but the sound is not pleasing. So for me, one of the most basic things I, I do still is just play A notes. And I'll manipulate the note in different ways to try and get it to be the most beautiful note, at least to how I hear beautiful note. Just there, right at the end, I felt like it was there. It's starting to ring a little bit and have a little bit more body. It's, it's a matter of finding that sort of sweet spot in the sound, because you can play it the same note with the same fingering and have it sound wildly different. So there's a pretty big target for each note to where you hit it. So the better you can get at centering that target right off the bat, the more success you're gonna have in creating just a pleasing sound. And one other thing that's really gonna help create a pleasing sound or, or help in assisting a student have a good sound is listening to good trumpet players. That's another thing I see neglected a lot, unfortunately. And it's sort of baffling in this day of YouTube and iTunes and it's all at our fingertips, the music, but people don't listen to great trumpet players. So if you wanna be a good orchestral trumpet player, listen to Dave Bilger, listen to Chris Martin, listen to Phil Smith. If you wanna be a great jazz player, listen to Clifford Brown, listen to Louis Armstrong. You have to get those sounds in your head. If you can't do that, if you don't know what you're trying to sound like, you're not gonna be able to produce that sound. I think that's a real pivotal thing for students to do. Mm -hmm.